What a wonderful song to sing this morning. You know, we are created and designed to worship, and each one of us will worship something or someone. And uh, what, a, what a great truth of Scripture to show that we are designed and created to worship the one who created us. And so I pray that as you are here this morning, that uh, you are here to worship the Lord, that uh, this, this whole worship service uh, is for our Lord Jesus. I'd invite you to turn with me in your Bible to Jonah chapter 3, verse 1. Jonah chapter 3, verse 1, as you turn there, we're acknowledging the truth of 2 Timothy 3.16, that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Now we have seen over the last number of weeks that Jonah was a servant of God. As you find your place there, I want you to consider for a moment another servant of God. His name was Peter. Hours before Jesus' unlawful arrest and the death on the cross for the sins of the world, Peter stood there and he denied Jesus. Now Jesus had warned Peter of what would take place, but Peter didn't believe him. Peter stood before Jesus and said, I will lay down my life for your sake. He went so far as to say to Jesus, even if all are made to stumble because of you, I will never be made to stumble. And then finally he said to Jesus in Matthew 26, verse 35, even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. Now, if you're familiar with Peter, you likely know how this story went. Peter did not only deny Jesus once or twice, he denied Jesus three times. And after that third denial, the Bible says in Luke 22, verses 61 and 62, and the Lord turned and looked at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word of the Lord and how he had said to him, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. So Peter went out and wept bitterly. You know, I can only begin to imagine Peter's devastation, feeling that he had been written off, feeling as though he was done, feeling as though he was finished as he, re as he ran off and wept. Jesus wasn't finished with Peter. Later on, after Jesus' death and resurrection, the disciples are fishing Peter spots Jesus from the boat, and he sees Jesus standing there on the shore. Peter jumps out of that boat, and he swims to shore. And on that shoreline, Jesus restores Peter. The Bible says in John 21, so when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he had said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Jesus went on to say to Peter, which I can only imagine just soothed his repentant soul. He said to Peter, follow me. This morning we see the actions of another servant of God, Jonah. Previously, God had said to Jonah, go. If you recall, Jonah said no. He did not go. This morning, God says go, and Jonah goes. Let's look together, Jonah chapter 3, beginning in verse number 1. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. 
Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, a three-day journey in extent. And Jonah began to enter the city on the first day's walk. Then he cried out and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So the people of Nineveh believed God, proclaimed a fast, and put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. Then word came to the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne and laid aside his robe, covered himself with sackcloth and sat in ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published throughout Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily to God. Yes, let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who can tell if God will turn and relent and turn away from his fierce anger so that we may not perish? Let's pray together this morning. Kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for who you are. The one true God, the creator of heaven and earth. Father, we thank you that you have given us your word. We know that the Bible is true because you are the author and you are true. Father, we know that the Bible is sufficient because you have given it to us and you are sufficient. Father, I pray this morning that you would take your word and you would apply it to our hearts. Father, I pray that as we need to be comforted by you today, you would comfort us. I pray, Lord, in areas where we need to be convicted by you, you would convict us. Father, I pray that you would sanctify us by your word. Your word is truth. And Lord Jesus, I pray today, as John the Baptist said, that you would increase and that I would decrease. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. As we look to the text today, we're going to see that the Lord gives Jonah a second chance. Next, Jonah obeys the Lord. And then thirdly, the Ninevites believe God and demonstrate repentance. Let's begin at verse number one, where we see that the Lord gives Jonah a second chance. The Bible says, now the word of the Lord came to Jonah. We have here the very same words that were used to begin this short four-chapter historical book. This time we have a distinctive phrase given at the end. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Consider now how Jonah responded the first time the word of the Lord came to him. Jonah disobeyed the Lord. Jonah went in the opposite direction of where the Lord had instructed him to go. The Bible tells us that he was attempting to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. You recall from the last number of weeks, he boarded a ship, but the Lord sent a great wind on the sea. The sea raged against the ship and against those who were on board. The sailors made attempts to keep the ship from being broken up. They came to the conclusion that it was Jonah. He was the reason for the terrible storm. And he proposes that he should be tossed overboard. The mariners initially try to row to shore. They are not successful. The storm grows worse. Jonah is tossed overboard. The raging sea stood down and ceased from its raging. The Bible tells us that the pagan sailors feared the Lord. They offered a sacrifice. They took vows. As Jonah went overboard, the historical account of what took place does not end. The Bible tells us, Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. It was from inside the belly of that fish that Jonah prayed. He thanked God for the salvation God had given to Jonah from the raging sea. 
The Bible tells us in chapter 2, verse 10, So the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. That is where we pick up in the text this morning. I'll remind you once again, what we are reading is a true historical account. The events recorded in these four chapters in the Bible happened exactly the way the Bible says they happened. So here we are in the text. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time. What a wonderful picture of God's mercy. Jonah was not warranted a second chance. God's mercy was on display to Jonah by giving him another chance. God's power was on display over his creation as he delivered Jonah from the sea using miraculous circumstances. When commanded by God to do something in his word, when God tells us to do something in his word, should you choose disobedience, don't always presume you will have a second chance. An individual in Luke 9, verse 61, said to Jesus, Lord, I will follow you, but let me first go and bid them farewell who are at my house. The Bible gives us Jesus' response in Luke 9, 62, but Jesus said to him, No one, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. When commanded by God in his word to do something, should you choose disobedience, don't presume that you have forfeited a second chance. As we saw a moment ago, Peter was restored to ministry by Jesus in John 21. When considering the Lord's commands and the importance of our obedience to him, know the truth of what God says in Job 9.4. God is wise in heart and mighty in strength. Who has hardened himself against him and prospered? So here we are in verse number one. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying. Well, let's look to the Bible, verse two, and see what was said. Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach to it the message I tell you. The very same instructions that were given to Jonah in chapter one, verse two. We have a slight variation in Jonah 1, 2. Jonah is told to cry out against Nineveh. Here in Jonah 3, 2, Jonah is told to preach to Nineveh. Same Hebrew word is used. We have a different English translation. Some believe the variation is due to, in chapter 1, Jonah is told to cry against Nineveh. And now here, Jonah is being told to cry to Nineveh, likely preparing us to the unlikely response of the Ninevites as they repent. So the Lord gives his prophet a second chance. The Lord gives his prophet the words he will have him preach. Now we see that Jonah obeys the Lord. Look to your Bible, verse number 3. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now remember, previously, Jonah had attempted to flee from the presence of the Lord. That did not go according to his plan. God rescued Jonah from what he thought was going to be his eternal prison on the bottom of the sea. Here we see the immediacy of Jonah's obedience. The Bible tells us Jonah arose and went. Look to your Bible, verse 3. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, a three-day journey in extent. The literal translation is that Nineveh was a great city to God. It points to the size of Nineveh. According to Jonah 4.11, more than 120,000 people lived there. Now look to your Bible, verse 4. And Jonah began to enter the city on the first day's walk. Jonah arrives to Nineveh as an ambassador to this pagan city. Jonah arrives there 
as a representative of his God, the living God, the one true God. Look to verse 4, then he cried out and said, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. The book of Jonah is here in a, in a section of scripture that we call the prophetic writings. Now, this verse is the only prophetic preaching that takes place in the entire book. In Hebrew, it is five simple words. But here Jonah is. He has been dispatched to Nineveh because their wickedness has come up before God. And he cries out to him and he says, you have 40 days to repent. One commentator made the point that Jonah's message to Nineveh was turn to the Lord or be overturned. We see here the compassion of the Lord is on display as he gives them time to repent. The Bible says in Jeremiah chapter 18, verses 7 through 10, The instant I speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom, to pluck up, to pull down, and to destroy it, if that nation against whom I have spoken turns from its evil, I will relent of the disaster that I thought to bring upon it. And the instant I speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to build and to plant it, if it does evil in my sight so that it does not obey my voice, then I will relent concerning the good with which I said I would benefit it. God shows great compassion. He shows great mercy upon Nineveh as he tells his prophet, declare to them they have 40 days to repent. So we turn now to Jonah. Jonah obeys the Lord. He brings God's message to Nineveh. The question remains, how will the Ninevites respond? Look to verse 5. We see that the Ninevites believed God and demonstrate repentance. The Bible says, so the people of Nineveh believed God. The literal translation there is, amen. The Ninevites agreed with Jonah's pronouncement of God's judgment. In a way, they were saying, yes, the wickedness that that we have been uh, accused of, we are guilty of it. We agree with God's judgment. Jesus would later say of the Ninevites in Matthew 12, verse 41, the men of Nineveh will rise up in the judgment with this generation and condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And indeed, a greater than Jonah is here. Look to your Bible again, verse 5. As a result of believing God, the Ninevites proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth. Now, in the ancient world, to proclaim a fast and to put on sackcloth was an outward demonstration of repentance. Sackcloth was was usually made from goat's hair. It was very thick. And this was done by everyone, the Bible says, from the greatest to the least of them. Now, Jonah's message made its way from the common folks all the way up to the the king and his nobles. Look to verse 6. Then word came to the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne and laid aside his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. So Jonah walks into Nineveh, and he has God's prophetic message for the people there of Nineveh, and he says, 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And there sat this powerful king, and God's prophetic message through his prophet was like a perfectly placed spear directly into the king. Because look at the actions of this king in verse number 6. The king of Nineveh arose from his throne. The king of Nineveh laid aside his robe, The king of Nineveh covered himself with sackcloth. The king of Nineveh sat 
in ashes. The actions of the king, the actions of the people, indicate genuine repentance. God had sent his prophet to proclaim his word. And the Bible says in Hebrews 4, 12 and 13, For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. So God's prophet had come into Nineveh. From the common folks all the way up to the king, the message had been received. There was genuine repentance. Look to your Bible, verse 7. This is the king, and he caused it to be proclaimed and published throughout Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles. So the king and his nobles have a decree for the people, and it had five key parts to it. Look to verse 7. Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink water. A fast is proclaimed by the king and his nobles. Then look to verse 8. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth. As mentioned earlier, that was an outward demonstration that inward repentance had taken place in the life of the people. Third, the people are commanded to cry mightily to God. Now think back of what we have learned just in this short historical book of Jonah about crying out to God. In Jonah chapter 1, the captain of the ship came to Jonah in the midst of the storm and he said, Arise, call on your God. Perhaps your God will consider us and we will not perish. We see in the text... Jonah did not cry out to his God. In Jonah 1.14, we have the sailors on board the ship. As the sea is raging against them, they cry out to God, and God provides salvation. Here we see the king and his nobles calling on the people to cry out to God. The fourth component of this decree Look to your Bible, verse 8. Let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. The repentance that the people claimed was to be demonstrated in their actions. The message from the king, the message we see here in the scripture is don't just say you have repented. Walk and live differently in accordance to, as a result of, your repentance. And then fifth, we have the hope that God will turn and relent. Look to your Bible, verse number nine. Who can tell if God will turn and relent and turn away from his fierce anger so that we may not perish? The Ninevites could not know how God would respond. Their only hope was that he would turn away from his fierce anger. Now, Lord willing, next week we'll look at Jonah 3, verses 10, uh, verse 10 through Jonah 4, verse, uh, 4, chapter 4, verse 4. And we see in verse 10, Then God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God relented from the disaster that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not. Lord willing, that will be for next week. But as we close this morning, let's consider a principle from this week. Let's consider the purpose behind God's mercy that he showed to Jonah. As Jonah entered the gates of Nineveh, Jonah did not come in and set up a booth and tell everybody, hey, gather around. I want you to come and hear the story of the man who spent three days in the belly of a fish. Let me tell you about the miraculous escape that I had. No, Jonah did not come in and set up a banner seeking to accomplish his own goals. He was on assignment. 
You see, Jonah, as a servant of the Lord, his master had given him a job to complete. If you have your Bibles there with you, I'd invite you to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse number 17. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse number 17. Earlier, as I described Jonah walking in to the Nineveh, I used the term ambassador. Well, that is exactly what Jonah was to Nineveh. And if you're here this morning, and you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, then that is exactly what you are to this world. You are an ambassador to this world for the Lord. If you found your place in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, please say, Amen. The Bible says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ, and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, As though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. With your Bibles open there to 2 Corinthians 5, verses 17 through 21. According to those very verses, if anyone is in Christ, the Bible tells us that that person is a new creation. The Bible says that old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. So if you're here today as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you are a new creation. You have been born again as the Scripture teaches. According here to 2 Corinthians 5, how has God reconciled us to himself? The Bible tells us through Jesus Christ. There is no other way to be reconciled to God than through Jesus Christ. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. Now God having reconciled us through, to himself through Jesus Christ, has given a task to each and every believer. God has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. That ministry is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. So as new creations, reconciled to God through Christ Jesus, we have been given the ministry of reconciliation. Having been given that ministry, we are ambassadors for Christ. Understand that well. If you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you are an ambassador for Him. You are a representative of Him to this world. And if you know anything about an ambassador, an ambassador does not show up with their own message. An ambassador shows up with the message that they have been given. That is our responsibility as Christians. If we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us, the Bible says we implore you on Christ's behalf to do what? Be reconciled to God. Church, that is the message our King has given us. As we represent Him to this world, the message we bring to this world is be reconciled to God. So if you're here today having received God's mercy, and He has given to you salvation from sin, and He's given to you eternal life, not by your works, but by His grace, 
I want to remind us that He has not given us the task of floating on a raft in a swimming pool. Instead, I want us to think of our commissioning that we are being sent out on a Coast Guard cutter. We're being sent out by our Master, our Lord Jesus, who has a mission, and that is to seek and to save those who are lost. Our our Master does the saving. We share His message. Be reconciled to God. If you're here today, and you have never been reconciled to God through Jesus Christ, I want to warn you, because you are headed toward eternal death. You are heading toward separation from God for eternity in a place called hell. Jesus described hell in Mark 9, verse 43, as a place where the fire that shall never be quenched. You have one way to avoid eternal separation from God in hell. And that is to be reconciled to God through Jesus Christ. The Bible says in 2 Peter 3, 9, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God's desire that if you're here today and you are separated from Him through sin, It is God's desire that you would be saved from sin and death. The Bible says in John 3, 16 and 17, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And then verse 17, For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. Just a moment ago, we read together in 2 Corinthians 5, verses 18 and 19. Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to Himself through Jesus Christ, and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to Himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. This last week in our Behold Your God study that we're doing on Wednesday nights, we looked at that word imputation. And we were given such a wonderful definition of what it means. Imputation means to place one person's sin or righteousness upon another's account. Adam's sin was imputed or transferred to all humanity. The believer's sin was placed upon the account of Jesus when he was crucified. Christ's righteousness, including all the blessings connected with it, is placed on the account of the believer. Thus, the believer's sin was given to Christ, and the Savior's perfect obedience was given to the believer. A moment ago, we read 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21. The Bible said, For he made him who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. There it is. We see the imputation right there upon the cross. We see the great exchange that takes place for the believer. Our sin for Christ's righteousness. If you're here today, and you're separated from God. My appeal to you from the Scriptures is be reconciled to God. Jesus said in Mark 1, verse 15, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Turn from sin and turn to Christ. That's the mercy that God has extended to each and every one of us. He's called us to repent. The Bible says He's long-suffering, He's patient, He wants all of us to. Turn from sin and turn to Christ.
Let's pray together this morning. Kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for who you are. Lord, we thank you that we get an opportunity this morning to see in your word how merciful you are. Lord, as we look at the wickedness of the Ninevites, you sent your prophet in and, and you, you, you commanded him to say that they had 40 days. Lord, and in your mercy, you received them when they repented. Father, we look at the wickedness in our world today. The message stays the same. We are to repent and believe the gospel. Father, I pray that you would send us out as your church, as ambassadors, that the message we would take to a lost and dying world is be reconciled to God, letting them know that Jesus is the only way. Father, help us and give us the strength as we go out in this world that is so hostile to you. Lord, help us to remain faithful with the message you have given us. And Father, if there's anyone here today that has not believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, that today you would impress upon their hearts the weight of eternity and they would repent and believe the gospel. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.